Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex with my co-host here, Anthony Rivardo. How's it going today, fellas? We are diving into a two-round mock draft today with two really phenomenal players, guys that can really upgrade the Giants. And as of late, I'm kind of getting confused as to what their plan actually is. You know, I'm, I'm seeing Dave Gettleman make comments, seeing Joe Judge make comments, and I can't really get a grasp of what they're trying to do. You know, releasing Kevin Zeitler, I heard a report that um, they didn't even offer Zeitler a reconstructed contract. They just cut him straight up. They didn't even offer him anything else, which is really kind of disappointing to me because now you have a massive hole at right guard. Right tackle, you know, you have Matt Parrott. It seems like there's optimism. They're going to keep Nate Solder around, which is a little bit problematic because he hasn't played right tackle in over a decade. Um, and, you know, <laughs> he hasn't played in over a year just, just uh, after opting out of COVID. So who knows what's going to happen there. So I'm really interest, interested to see what they do this offseason in terms of the draft and free agency, how they can supplement some of these holes, also bolstering the defense and getting a wide receiver. So Anthony and I are here to talk a little bit about this and how they can use the draft to really improve their team as a whole, the first two rounds specifically. But Anthony, before we dive into this cool mock draft, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing real good, and I too am a little bit confused with what the Giants' plans are on the offensive line. So, the the Kevin Zeitler release, right? It either says one of two things: either the Giants feel really confident that they can go cheaper at that position, find somebody in free agency or the draft to really fill in and um, play at the level that Kevin Zeitler did, right? Or they're very confident in the guards that they already have on their roster. It's one of those two things. I don't know if they're that confident in Shane Lemieux and Will Hernandez, if they're going to move one of them over to the right side of the line. You know, typically that's not the easiest thing for offensive linemen to do, to flip sides like that. But, you know, Shane Lemieux is young enough. He played, you know, some center and some guard in training camp for the Giants. Maybe they feel like he's young enough to the point where they can just move him across the line and it shouldn't be an issue. Then, of course, the Nate Solder thing is super confusing. I think, you know, everybody knows my opinion. I'm not really too excited about seeing Nate Solder suit back up in a Giants uniform. Don't think it's necessary. I really like Matt Parrott. I think that he's ready to go. He should be starting there. Don't want to see Nate Solder start over him. Don't think that's fair to Matt Parrott. He showed a lot last year. Even Dave Gettleman said he showed a lot, and he's very confident in him going forward as a starter. So I really want to see Matt Parrott start there unless we draft or sign someone else you know that's really the only way that I want to see another offensive tackle starting other than Matt Parrott not really a big fan of Nate Solder I think that's a contract that they should cut but realistically if they restructure it they might actually be able to free up a more cap space this year than they would by just straight up cutting Nate Solder and of course with the Kevin Zeitler contract one thing I'll say they can't actually restructure that since it was the last year of his deal but they could have extended him and in, in theory, restructured his contract through an extension, gotten that cap hit down. And I would have liked to see that. You know, I said that from the start, I thought that just straight up cutting Kevin Zeitler was a bad idea. I wanted to see them extend Kevin Zeitler or, you know, try and trade him. They did try to trade him. They didn't get any takers, which is unfortunate. But I thought that, you know, instead they should have extended him because he's still a solid player. He's only 31 years old, which isn't that old for an offensive lineman. But that's neither here nor there. Now he's a free agent. Now the Giants have a couple holes on their offensive line. Not really sure how they're going to fill all of those holes, but it's going to be an interesting offseason. You know, we do have a lot of young talent on this offensive line, so hopefully these guys can develop. And hopefully, another thing to point out, hopefully this offensive scheme can help this offensive line, you know, not put them in such difficult situations in terms of wide receivers, running all curls, not separating, and then the offensive line breaking down and giving up sacks, right? So goes hand in hand, the scheme, the players on the offensive line, the coaching, all of that goes hand in hand in hand. So it's going to be really interesting to see what the Giants shape out over these this next month and a half or so leading up through the draft and, you know, eventually into the season with the offensive line. Yeah, I think that's a pretty a pretty fair assessment. And what I will say is, you know, releasing Kevin Seidler saved them $12 million. They can probably go out and find um, and maybe even sign a multi-year deal for, for another right guard who's younger and might provide them a little bit more security down the line at a cheaper cost right now. So there's a couple guys that just hit the free agent market and you know, I'll list a couple of them. Joe Thune, um, Gabe Jackson, they just cut Trey Turner from Carolina. He's a, a, a Pro Bowl guard too, you know, another Dave Gettleman guy there. He's going to save them $11 million against their cap. So maybe there's an opportunity there for the Giants to say, okay, Trey Turner, you know, Pro Bowl guard, Let's go out, sign him to a three-year deal, lower the cap at this year, push in that next season. Now you have your solution at right guard, and you can just move Nate Solder, and you can use a, a similar style um, that they did last season with Nate Solder and Matt Pert, or rather Cam Fleming and Matt Pert, and just rotate Solder and Pert. Pert, sorry. Someone called me out for saying Pert. It's Pert. 
um, you know, rotating Pert and Solder and just kind of seeing how they develop, you know, how they take to it. Uh, maybe Pert is able to hold it down long term and really makes a big jump because I know he was doing really, really well before he got COVID. And then there was a game against Baltimore where he let up like three consecutive sacks. Um, he, it's been up and down in terms of his, uh, his efficiency last season, so I really want to see more continuity with him. And I think you can get that if you do use Nate Solder and, and Pert as a rotational kind of aspect. Maybe they can find a solution there. But I think you know Trey Turner might be a guy they look at and say three-year deal. Uh, maybe that's where we go. Uh, with this with this right guard position, but you know that leads us to the draft because I'm not totally sold on the concept of signing um, you know another offensive lineman at right tackle specifically. I would rather just cut uh, Nate Solder and find someone a little bit cheaper, use that money towards the draft, and you know I just I just don't trust him. Yeah, how can you, I can't really justify uh, trusting a guy who hasn't played right tackle in over a decade, just missed an entire season in a new scheme. Um, and making a transition to another position, and, you know, it's a lot easier said than done. It really is, and, and I'm not totally convinced that he is the guy to do it. Now, the contract being pushed next year really hurts us because if you do cut him post June 1st and save 10 million dollars, it pushes that 4 million dollars to next off season. So now you're already losing a bit of money. Um, you know, there it, there are like complications, implications of of restructuring deals and post June 1st cuts and stuff like that. So have to keep those things in context. Um, but you know, in the first round of the draft, in the first guy that we have in this mock specifically is Northwestern tackle um, Rashawn Slater at 11. Now, Anthony, what do you think about Rashawn Slater as a prospect? Do you think, you know, he will stick at tackle? Because I know some people think he could move inside to guard. But this is a position the Giants really, really would love to just lock up. If you get Rashawn Slater and you sign a right guard like Trey Turner for a three-year deal... I'm feeling good about going into this upcoming season when Andrew Thomas, Nick Gates, even Will Hernandez and Shane Wheel left guard. I feel good with Rashawn Slater at right tackle and Trey Turner or a guy, you know, someone that's maybe even a little bit of an upgrade compared to Kevin Zeiler or someone that's long-term and can hold it down at right guard. I would feel good about the offensive line right now. I feel completely terrified about this, this plan. So Rashawn Slater is a prospect that I do really like. I don't exactly know if he's going to make it to the 11th overall pick. I could realistically see him going within the top seven picks in this draft. You know, I, I think there's going to be three uh, quarterbacks taken in the top 10, two offensive linemen, I think two playmakers, one receiver, one Kyle Pitts. And I think that, you know, you could maybe even see two defenders go as well. It's not going to be all offense, of course. So, you know, if Rashawn Slater falls to us, home run selection, you know, depending on who else is on the board. I know a lot of Giants fans want to see us go offensive playmaker. I would actually like that as well. But you get Rashawn Slater, you have one of two things locked in four years, right? It's either he goes over to right tackle and succeeds there, and he becomes a really good right tackle. If not, he moves inside to guard, and you already know he's got the traits to be a phenomenal offensive guard. You know, he could start right away at right guard or right tackle, whichever one you need him to do. Personally, I think that he's good enough. He's going to succeed on the outside at right tackle, and I think that if the Giants were to draft him, they would be stupid to not try and put him at right tackle first, let him play there. If he fails, then you move him inside. Now, I'll also say, though... Um, kind of a counterpoint to my own point, if the Giants are that confident in Matt Parrott, they can keep him at right tackle and just put Rashawn Slater in at right guard immediately, and then you could just go ahead with that offensive line. So I guess they could, in theory, do that, but I think that you're kind of wasting Rashawn Slater's talents in a way because he's a really good offensive tackle. He had a very impressive pro day. We saw him fly upward in his vertical jump. We saw him uh, squat like 700 pounds or something crazy. Saw him run a really impressive 40 time, showed a lot of speed. This is a guy with a really quick feet and really nice technique um you know I, I think that he's a player well if you look at his stats he only allowed two sacks in his collegiate career he played two seasons 2018 2019 he only allowed two sacks um and four hurries in 2019 that's it only four hurries which is phenomenal um you know he's a natural athlete and he's a guy that i think is going to be a really solid nfl player you know he's flying up draft boards right now you didn't hear that much about him a couple months ago but now there's serious top 10 overall buzz for him he's really impressing in all of those workouts and another thing, he has experience playing both left and right tackle. So he has technically more career snaps at right tackle, 
but he did play better at left tackle and he played left tackle more recently. He didn't play in 2020, opted out. 2018, he played 1,048 snaps at right tackle. 2019, he played 783 snaps at left tackle, right? So he was a much better player at left tackle as well. He had zero sacks there and only four hurries. Um, when he was playing right tackle, he allowed two sacks and 15 hurries, so not as good, but he was still really impressive. Plus, you got to keep in mind that he was a lot younger back then, so that also plays um, into that. So, you know, we didn't get to see him in 2020, which is unfortunate, but I think that he's a really solid prospect based on what he did in those two years of college that we did get to watch him play. And I, I think he's going to go in the top 10, but if he does fall to 11, he would be an excellent pick for the Giants. Would really be a great bookend on the other side of Andrew Thomas to fortify this offensive line for years to come. Yeah, I mean, the big, the big knock on him is that he has a little bit um, below average arm reach. And that's kind of why they're like, oh, maybe he's better at guard because of it, because he doesn't have that, that length you preferably have as a tackle. They said the same thing about Tristan Wirfs. He was an all-pro exactly. in the season. So. Exactly. They so, say it every year. There's always an offensive tackle prospect. Every single year they say that. And every single year, he well, not every single year, but usually every year, he just comes out and succeeds at offensive tackle anyway. So I, don't I know. think they say it about every tackle. I mean, they're saying it about Alex Leatherwood, too, from Alabama. He I've even heard it about Penny Sewell. I like, I've heard it about every single Oh, I heard that, too. I heard prospect. that, too. It's crazy. Um, but no, what, okay, so what I do like specifically about Rashawn Slater is the versatility to play multiple positions if you needed him to. If you were like... If you had a problem at left guard or right guard, you could be like, Rashawn, like, can you can you help us out there? And he would be able to go and play it. Like, he's that versatile. Um, and, you know, the Giants, specifically, you know, Graham and Judge love multiples. They love players that can do multiple things, play multiple positions. Slater can do that. You know, if Andrew Thomas were to get injured, he can move him over to left tackle and he'd be totally fine. Like, that's just the type of player he is. Um, and the guy's strong as hell. Six foot four, 304 pounds, like Anthony mentioned. 4.88 second 40 yard dash. I know the 40 yard dash isn't the biggest uh, thing, but for offensive linemen, it's a little bit more important because it really does show that athleticism. It really is a good indicator of athleticism. Um, you know, but when you have wide receivers who are running super fast anyway, sometimes it's hard to decipher, you know, those translatable traits. But um, the cone drill, 7.48, uh, he's, he's a phenomenal prospect. You know, that's really uh, what it boils down to. And I think if the Giants really want to solve this offensive line problem once and for all, they're gonna go with Slater or Sewell. God, you know, God willing that he drops that far. I highly doubt he will, but I'm assuming Slater is the one that falls if any of them do. Um, and you finally have your right tackle solution. You know, we've been going at right tackle for a while now. Mike Remmers, uh, Cam Fleming, you know, Matt Perrin. I I feel good about Matt Perrin, but I don't think he's ready yet. I think he needs another season at least. Um, but with that being said, it's never a bad thing to have a to have a offensive tackle depth. You know, when Nate Solder, they eventually move on from him, which I imagine will be within the next season or two, if not this upcoming, this off season, you have Matt, per Matt Pert as a, as a swing tackle, you know, someone who could plug and play if you need them to. That's the problem that the Chiefs had in the Super Bowl, by the way, they didn't have a guy like that, and Patrick Mahomes got slaughtered. You know, having someone who can fill in at right or left tackle is super valuable in the NFL. So if Matt Pert ends up becoming that guy, I am so okay with that, I am totally fine with that. Um, and then you have Rashawn Slater as a starting right tackle who, you know, really has been healthy, he opted out last year, but he is, he's a phenomenal prospect, and I think he's going to have a very successful NFL career. Um, now, I'll jump in real quick yeah, right please. before we move on to the next pick. I want to point this out in terms of his athleticism and measurables at his pro day. Now, of course, take everything from every pro day with a grain of salt this year, you know, because we don't have the NFL Combine. But with Rashawn Slater, I'm going to compare his measurables to Tristan Wirfs um, at the Combine last year. <laughs> Tristan Wirfs ran a 40-yard dash of a 4.85 second compared to um, Rashawn Slater's unofficial 4.88. But now here's a really key difference, right? When we talk about whether or not the 40-yard dash is important for offensive linemen, usually we say no, because when is an offensive lineman going to run 40 yards? You know, usually it doesn't happen. I've actually seen Tristan Wirfs do it. It's been applied for Tristan Wirfs because he's that crazy crazy of an athlete he does run 40 yards down the field but the more important statistic in that 40 yard dash is actually the 10 yard split if you can run a really good 10 yard split that shows your ability to get to the next level with a lot of speed and quickness right Tristan Wirf's 10 yard split last year was 1.72 seconds very impressive time Rashawn Slater's 10 yard split unofficial at his pro day was 1.68 seconds Super, super impressive time. His measurables are very similar to Tristan Wirfs. He did put up 33 bench press reps. Wirfs only did 24, though. You know, and um, let's see, the three cone. His three cone was actually much faster than Tristan Wirfs. So last year, we were all raving about how great of an athlete Tristan Wirfs was, how great his quickness was, all of that. 
Rashawn Slater has actually beat him in pretty much every quickness and agility testing result. So very impressive. He's an absolutely phenomenal athlete. You know, of course, like I said, take all these pro day results with a grain of salt. But from what we've seen, the unofficial times are very, very impressive. And it just speaks to how great of an athlete Rashawn Slater is. Day one in the NFL should be able to start absolutely inside. And hopefully, I, I really do think that he will be a phenomenal tackle from the start. Yeah, absolutely. And apologies for uh, little, little Dave Gellman making an appearance here. He was been knocking on my leg, so I had to pick him up and get, show him some love. Um, if you saw that episode a couple a couple of months ago, very funny. He, he tends to distract me while I am podcasting. But nonetheless, the, the wide receiver position still needs to be solved. You know, we, we addressed the offensive tackle position in round one of this, of this specific scenario, the specific mock, but that still leaves a major hole at wide receiver. We know the Giants need help. Um, especially with the playmaker position and that category. And for the number, uh, the second overall pick, or rather the second round pick, 42nd overall, we would pick LSU wide receiver Tyrus Marshall. And this is a player who is extremely diverse, very versatile. Um, he can play Z, he can play X, he can play in the slot. Um, Anthony was mentioning before the podcast, he played pr primarily in the slot last year. 2019, he played primarily on the X on the outside. Um, but he can do it all, and it's really awesome to see him being able to, you know, go to different alignments and succeed there because that means he's versatile. And you know, when you have a wide receiver who can do that, you can do so many unique things and really get creative on offense. And the one thing I love about him is his size. You know, a lot of people keep saying we want a big body receiver, we want someone who can go up and catch uh, red zone passes, and we got we want someone who can dominate and possess the ball. You know, be a possession receiver. He's six foot three and two hundred pounds, and the guy's twenty years old. He's a, he's a baby. Um, you know, we're looking at this is something Anthony mentions. Uh, age, you know, he. When we look at Devonta Smith, we look at Jalen Waddle. They're both 22. Uh, Terrace Marshall's 20 years old, so he's an extra two years of development that he hasn't even touched yet. The upside for this kid is massive. You know, we're talking about somebody, somebody coming from LSU, Justin Jefferson. You know, he was sh overshadowed by Jamar Chase. Justin Jefferson um, really was able to wake up this year and really had the team to himself. And he ended up posting pretty good numbers: 731 yards and 10 touchdowns over seven games. He was an absolute tank, and that's without Joe Burrow, mind you. So really incredible statistics. I think this is a player that we should not be sleeping on. If he fell to 42, you don't hesitate. You know, this is a playmaker here, especially if you go off to tackle in the first round, Anthony. What are you thinking about Terrace Marshall and his upside? I think this is a player who could really end up being a stud at the next level. Yeah, I love LSU wide receivers. You know, if I don't really watch college football like that, don't really have a favorite team. But if I did have a favorite team, it would be LSU. I love a lot of players that come out of LSU and especially wide receivers. You know, I'm a huge fan of Jamar Chase. I loved Justin Jefferson coming out, and I really like Terrace Marshall coming out as well. But one thing that I'll say, you know, there is a trend going on in the NFL right now where slot receivers are no longer the smallest receivers on the field or the quickest receivers on the field, right? There is this new trend called the jumbo slot. And that's kind of the role that Terrace Marshall played because he is a larger stature guy he's six foot three 200 pounds so he was kind of playing that jumbo slot so one thing that I'll say I don't want to see anybody in these in the comments going oh finally we get our big body outside wide receiver and Terrace Marshall that's not necessarily what he is he doesn't really beat press coverage like that he's not going to be your ex receiver I was actually listening to Trevor Sikama of the draft network speaking with John Schmelk of Giants.com on a podcast recently when he was discussing Terrace Marshall he said yeah I, I really like him but his fit for the Giants might not exactly work out because with the Giants, you know, they've already got Darius Slayton playing that Z receiver role, being that vertical threat. But I think that's kind of what Terrace Marshall would be playing for the Giants. He would be playing that Z receiver role because he's not getting off of press coverage the way that you want him to. But he is a great vertical threat if he can get that free release. That's why they moved him into the slot this year. He wasn't really beating press coverage. Granted, he's only 20 years old. He has a lot of time to improve on that. And if he can learn how to beat press coverage, he could be a dominating X receiver. He's got a great body type similar to Julio Jones in his size and stature and quickness even. He's very quick, got a lot of speed. Again, great, great vertical threat. But this year, 2020, he had 96 snaps out wide compared to 308 snaps in the slot. Now, I don't mind that, but I know a lot of Giants fans don't really want the Giants to draft a slot receiver. They want that big body X receiver, line up on the line of scrimmage, beat press coverage, go up there, see ball, get ball. That's what they want, right? 
I don't mind getting a guy that dominated out of the slot and can dominate from the Z receiver position. I really liked Harris Marshall as a prospect because of that, but I just don't think that he's exactly what Giants fans are looking for right now. You know, I will say in 2019, when they had Justin Jefferson, um, Harris Marshall did play way more out wide. He played 486 snaps and uh, out wide with only 173 in the slot. But once Justin Jefferson made it to the NFL, they were like, okay, our system is really reliant on that slot receiver position. Terrace Marshall, he doesn't really get off of press coverage like that. Let's move him into the slot, see what he can do. And he was phenomenal in the slot. So I think that's something just to keep in mind, you know, like he is great. He's pretty good after the catch as well. But, you know, as Pro Football Focus points out, he is still a string bean. That's the quote for him. A good chuck ends him. He's really not beating that press coverage, those physical cornerbacks yet. And he did have some concentration drops. He had seven drops on 55 catchable balls in 2020. So that's another thing to keep an eye on. But he does have an amazing catch radius. He goes up there. He can locate the ball from any angle. Great body control when he's going up there and making plays. Um, maybe not the most refined route runner. But again, he's got so much room to grow. We're not talking about a guy like Devontae Smith who hit his prime once he was three years older than every cornerback he was going up against. We're talking about a guy who's younger than a lot of cornerbacks he's going up against and still dominating them in Terrace Marshall. So that's what I really love about him. A lot of untapped potential there. Maybe not that big body X receiver, but definitely can be that jumbo slot or that Z receiver versus threat and has a lot of room to grow into that X receiver role. So I think that he is a phenomenal prospect. I love his fit with the Giants in the certain scenario, you know, round two. Um, I think that he's a great player. So I don't know. I just a little curious about his fit in terms of whether or not he's going to play slot or Z or X, but I think he's got the potential to play X, which is pretty exciting. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, the fact that they call him a string bean opens up something for me. And what it says to me is, He's 20 years old. Of course he's a string bean. Guy can't even drink alcohol legally yet. Wait until he has a few beers, a few calories on that, on that body. He's going to be fine. He's going to be fine. You know, and, and that actually excites me because when you have a guy that's 6'3 and 200 pounds, they can start him out as a Z and slot receiver. You know, they can start him out there, like, you, you know, aligning him in different spots. And as he puts on mass, they can then move him to the X spot, which will only help his growth. Because he'll be refined in the slot or a vine C or fine Z receiver, and then he'll have experience at X long term. So he'll be able to move in and out and do very, very creative things on the offense, and he'll be like inside and out a great player because he knows how to play multiple positions um, and alignments as a wide receiver. So that's what really excites me about him. His his size right now might actually end up being a positive thing because it'll get him some more reps at other spots, other alignments that otherwise he might not be. Uh, willing to be placed in so maybe that's something that the Giants could look to do with a player like him um, use him diversely use him creatively and maximize you know his potential now and then and then grow with him you know develop the scheme as he grows as a player and you know that's kind of what enticed me about him just so much upside with him um, we saw the production he was averaging over 100 yards per game um, in just seven contests he had over a touchdown a game for LSU last year 10 scores this is a kid that people you know are sleeping on not really sleeping on but I've seen him going first round. I've heard he could go to the second round. If he fell to 42, it would be a blessing, a blessing in disguise for us. Um, really, not really a disguise. It would be an absolute freaking blessing if he fell to 42. But I don't think he's gonna he's gonna drop out of the first round. Um, similar to Rashawn Slater, but you never know. You know, there's receivers always drop, so you never know. Receivers often do drop, um, you know, like last year we had three top 10 talents. None of them went in the top 10, right? Like that happens when it's a really loaded wide receiver class. We'll see guys, especially those guys that are supposed to go in the back end of the first round. They just start slipping and falling. So I could see Terrace Marshall realistically being on the board for the Giants. He's got a second round projection by PFF. But one thing that I'll say... You know, you mentioned it, you kind of hit on it. What I love about Terrace Marshall is room to grow. He's got so much untapped potential. He's 20 years old. He's got all the traits to be everything you want from a wide receiver. He just hasn't actually had the opportunity to put that all together yet because he's only 20 years old. So, you know, get him in the NFL, get him that proper coaching. And I think that he really could be that do it all guy with that great catch radius, good routes. You know, he can be that X receiver. He can do everything that you want him to do. He just needs some time to grow. But one thing that I'll say when you're the Giants, right, if we're looking at it from the Giants' perspective, what we're saying is we need to immediately try and get this wide receiver for Daniel Jones in order for him to succeed in his third season, right? 
but we're not necessarily going to be able to have that with Terrace Marshall. I don't think that he's a guy that steps in day one, makes an impact like that. I think that he needs time to grow. Like I said, tons of room to grow. He's got such a high ceiling, but he needs some time. So I think that he's a guy that's going to be more impactful in his second season rather than his first season. And that's really what you're looking at when you're drafting a round two wide receiver anyway. So I love the value in the second round. If he's there, Giants definitely should take him, especially if they go offensive line in round one. But, you know, just keep in mind, I don't think that he's going to be that dominant number one receiver in this draft class right away. I think he's a guy that just needs a lot of time and room to grow at 20 years old with all of these traits that he has and a lot of a lot of room to be a special player in this league. Absolutely, guys. So, you know, let us know what you think on YouTube. Uh, of course, the comment section is open for discussion. We want to talk to you guys about these two selections specifically. Some people might not like the idea of drafting a tackle so high um, like Rashawn Slater, but I do think he's capable of being a phenomenal player. Um, and if you don't go with offensive linemen in the first round, you can go with a Wyatt Davis. You can go with the Creed Humphreys. There's so many options, guys. There's so many players. Um, you can wait if you need to. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, but with that being said, guys, I, sorry, I sent Anthony something hilarious, and I just can't stop thinking about it. Um, but guys, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit the subscribe button below on YouTube. Turn on the notifications on Spotify and Apple. We really appreciate all the support. And we will catch you guys on the next video. Have an amazing weekend.